The city of Lagos is known for many things. That for several minutes, running into hours. In Motala Mohammed, the third military head of state of post independence Nigeria, was assassinated with ease at a traffic jam in Lagos. Welcome to this edition of Back in History. Motala Muhammad had dressed up for work. His aides were prepared to drive him to work. His workplace at the time was Dodan Barracks, which was the seat of government. Motala must have bid his wife at Joke and his six children farewell with a promise to return home at the close of work. Motala set out in his black Mercedes saloon car, driven by his official driver. He drove through George Street, and on approaching the Federal Secretariat in Ekoi, there was a traffic jam, and Motala's vehicle waited to observe the traffic. Motala did not know that he was not going to be alive beyond the traffic point. Some armed soldiers, led by Lieutenant Colonel Bukasoka Dimka, had positioned themselves at a petrol station in the opposite direction. They were dressed in long flowing babariga and their weapons were hidden in the babariga. As Motala's vehicle waited for the traffic to clear, the soldiers drew closer and opened fire directly at the Mercedes Benz. The shooting was sporadic and gave the occupants no chances of survival. Motala Mohammed was killed. His ADC Lieutenant Akintunde also died on the spot. The vehicle which was riddled with bullets is preserved to today at the National Museum Lagos. At the time of his death, Motala Mohammed had only been in office as military head of state for 200 days. Motala was only 37 years old at the time. Aside the traffic situation, the other thing that made it very easy for Motala to be killed was the fact that he was a head of state who was not used to traveling with military backup or escorts. It is reported that at the time of his assassination, the only visible sign of protection was a pistol carried by his orderly, thus making the assassination seamless and without resistance whatsoever. Motala was flown from Lagos to Kano, where he was buried in accordance with Islamic rites. A Christian memorial service was also held in his honor in Lagos State with his deputy Loshegono Basenjo in attendance. Motala Mohammed was never to be seen again, having been cut short at the age of 37. His ADC Lieutenant Akintunde was also buried after a church service was conducted in his honor. Lieutenant Colonel Buka Sukademka, the mastermind of Motala's assassination, could not take over the reins of power. His coup thus went down in history as an unsuccessful coup. A couple of things worked against Dimka. Immediately after the assassination of Motala Mohammed, Dimka was at Radio Nigeria, calm in their respective spots. No divisional commander will issue orders or instructions until further notice. Any attempt to follow these plans from any quarters will be met with death. You are warned. It is all over the 19 states. All borders A and C are closed until further notice. Curfew is imposed from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Thank you. We are all together. It is also reported that Dimka had made a quick trip to the British High Commission where he met with the British High Commissioner Sir Martin Lequins and told him to get in contact with Yakubu Gawon, who at the time was in London 
having earlier been removed from office by a military coup led by Motala Mohammed. Dimka then told the High Commissioner to reach out to Yakubu Gowon and tell him to proceed to Togo and await further instruction. The High Commissioner declined his request. It was thus not clear whether Dimka executed the coup to enable him to succeed Motala Mohammed as head of state or to enable him to pave way for General Gowon to return to Nigeria and continue in office as head of state. Dimka's coup was largely characterized by confusion and lack of coordination. While Dimka was at Radio Nigeria running the national broadcast, serious efforts were being made by the military to crush Dimka's coup. There was a counter broadcast from Benin by the then brigade commander, Cornelisa Buka, disassociating other army units from the coup. There was another broadcast from Kaduna and another one from Calabar by the then brigade commander, Colonel Maman Vatsa. University students from Lagos and Ibadan also took to the streets to protest the coup. The coup attempt eventually failed about seven hours later when Colonel Ibrahim Babangida surrounded Radio Nigeria with armored tanks manned by soldiers under his command and moved personally into the studio unarmed to have a conversation with Dimka, whom he described as a close friend during his recent interview with Channels Television. It is said by some that Dimka was a lover of champagne and that Babangida went to meet Dimka at the radio station with a bottle of champagne with full knowledge that Dimka would be excited by it. Without much ado, the coup plotters were dislodged from the radio station and Dimka escaped. Dimka first ran to Jos and then to Afikbu in the then Anambra states. Radio announcements were made every 15 minutes calling on everyone who sees Dimka to immediately report him to the nearest police station or army post. Dimka was a smart man and was able to beat the roadblocks without being noticed. Dimka would have escaped to any neighboring country unnoticed, but he stopped over at Afikbu to meet an old girlfriend, Ugo, would later prove to be a costly decision for Dimka. During the Nigerian Civil War and after the war, Dimka had served as an officer in Afikbu and was very popular among the people there. He was not someone that could hide in Afikbo, even at night. He was a jolly good fellow among the locals. He had a lot of friends and so it was easy for people to identify Dimka. Dimka was seen trolling, strolling near the Afikbo mosque and later seen checking into Friendship Hotel Afikbo. He checked in with a fictitious name. He later sent for Ugo, who came to the hotel to spend the night with him. The first room he checked into had burglary proof, but Dimka insisted that the room be changed for him. He got a room that had no burglary proof. This was done with a reason. The unprotected window would later serve as his escape route. While they in the hotel, Information got to the army and the hotel was surrounded at night. But the soldiers only concentrated on the front of the hotel. The soldiers began checking the hotel room by room and when they tapped on a nearby door, Dimka told his girlfriend Ugo to go and open the door for them while Dimka escaped through the toilet window and ran away. He went through the farmlands and then entered a window, a vehicle, across the road to escape to Abakaliki. Every three kilometers on the road had a roadblock. At a point on the journey, Dimka voluntarily handed over himself to a police sergeant at a checkpoint. He told him, I quote, I am Dimka, the man you have been looking for. He brought out his hands 
and was immediately handcuffed by the policeman who then took him away and handed him over to the military. Dimka was later tried by a military tribunal and to the surprise of many, Dimka did not deny his involvement in the coup throughout the sitting of the tribunal. When a recorded message in connection with the coup was played to him at the tribunal, Dimka boldly admitted that the voice on the tape was his own. Well, I didn't have enough time, but I thought the base, I mean, initial state was going to allow me to speak to that. Anyway, I'm, I thank you very much actually for having come. In fact, if there's anybody who enjoys uh, any... Uh, of course, being a soldier, I made it a point of duty that I own I mean, I have an honor to maintain, and I believe uh, I have no reason at this stage uh, to lie. So all that you have heard uh, has been my recording, personal recording. On 15th May 1976, Dimka was found guilty by the tribunal and was publicly executed by firing squad at the Krikri Maximum security prison in Lagos. It is stated that even after being tied to the stake for execution, Dimka requested that the younger officer who was stationed to shoot him should first give him a salute and compliments as a senior military officer. This brought to an end the military career and life of Colonel Buka Suka Dimka one of the earliest foreign trained military officers in Nigeria. Dimka attended the Australian Officer Cadet School, Potsi, where he trained and was commissioned in 1963 as a second lieutenant for the Nigerian Army. His execution was announced by Motala's successor, Olushegun Obasanjo. The council has confirmed the sentences by the tribunal. Those condemned to death by firing squad have been executed today. Motala Mohammed and Dimka were not enemies. Himself and Motala had participated in the counter coup of 1966 that removed General Ironsi and brought in General Yakubu Gawon. He later participated in the coup that brought in Motala to power. It is maintained in some quarters that Motala had promised to create some states for Nigeria and that one of the states he promised to create was to be known as mainland states, which was to be carved out of the present-day Cross River State with headquarters in a back region of present-day Akwaibom states, and that Dimka was to be the military governor of the mainland states. Motala indeed created some states, but did not create mainland states and did not make Dimka a military governor. It is said that Dimka became angry with Motala Mohammed from that moment, having already prepared to be sworn in as the military governor of one of the new states. Unfortunately, neither Motala nor Dimka is alive to confirm this narrative. But whatever the narrative and whatever the intention may have been, the truth remains. That Motala Mohammed was killed in Lagos State, Nigeria, by a group of soldiers led by Dimka. General Motala Mohammed was born in Kano State on 8 November 1938. He attended the famous Barewa College and later attended the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. He was the brain behind the relocation of the Federal Capital Territory of Nigeria from Lagos to Abuja. He was married to a Yoruba woman, Ajoke Muhammad, and the marriage was blessed with six children.